Great, thank you, Dr. Forthall. Um, all right, we're gonna switch over to the clinical presentation and um, have a lot of slides to try to do uh, it in a whirlwind and save some questions for later. Um, okay, so I think many of you have seen this uh, Johns Hopkins live map, daily updated map. And at this point, as of this morning, I'm sure it's changed by now, uh, over 250,000 cases worldwide with uh, 10,000 plus um, deaths. And here's the picture of what things look like in the United States. We're at 16,600 plus and uh, total deaths so far, 216. And here's the picture for Orange County cases. Um, here we can see that so far, uh, we know that testing has been ramped up um, and slowly ramping up, but you can see that so far total cases, 65 total deaths are at zero. Okay, so how does coronavirus actually present? Um, the incubation period, when we talk about the time between the symptoms right, um, beginning uh, after the time of exposure is around four days uh, from exposure, the range being two to 14 days. And the majority of people who get sick with coronavirus are going to be manifest as a mild infection, about 81% of mild flu-like symptoms resolving over the uh, first one or two weeks. Um, and then gaining immunity, as Dr. Forthall has, has mentioned. And then we have the subset that progress to moderate to the, or severe pneumonia, about 15% of individuals. And the range between moderate to severe is broad enough. There are some moderate patients who can be managed at home. Um, and then severe pneumonia. A lot of the studies that we are seeing out there are really talking about the people who get hospitalized. So um, severe pneumonia, 15%. And, Often, when you make that change from um, mild to moderate uh, disease, it seems to happen around the second week of illness, days 5 to 13, uh, median of day 8. And most of the data, as I mentioned, was among uh, hospitalized patients. About 20% of hospitalized patients require the ICU. 5% of all patients end up in the ICU, 20% um, of hospitalized. Um, Respiratory failure is seen uh, with ARDS on um, 17 to 30% and septic shock. All right, so signs and symptoms. Really, um, if you look at almost all of the studies that have come out, whether in, in hospitalized patients or in surveillance uh, data, you can see that fever is a predominant um, symptom. Sooner or later, a person does develop a fever. It can be prolonged, it can be intermittent. That's a little different from the flu, a little bit different than. Uh, the cold where you start seeing things early on and the, then the fever kind of goes away as you resolve your illness. Um, cough uh, is present in uh, some studies about half patients to 82 percent. Often it is dry and mostly it is non-productive coughing. Um, myalgia or fatigue often noted up to half of cases, shortness of breath up to a third of patients, and less commonly reported symptoms um, that often occur before the onset of this more classic prodrome, if you'll call it that at this time, the sore throat, headache, and GI symptoms. There's been a lot in the literature. In the last two days, there was another article in the New England Journal talking about GI manifestations um, with diarrhea and nausea. It's been reported in uh, the ranges from 15 to about 40% um, of patients uh, antedating their onset of fever. Uh, how does, it's hard, we're in the flu season, how do we tell the difference between coronavirus, influenza, and the common cold? It really is um, striking, at least between the common cold and the coronavirus, that the common cold really seems to be a focus in the upper airway. Cough, sore, sore throat, sneezing, runny nose. Think of the nose and the mouth. When you get to coronavirus, actually, sore throat, sneezing, runny nose have been reported, but they are not as common uh, by far uh, as fever, headache, myalgia, fatigue, shortness of breath. Really is a little bit of a different prodrome than you would expect uh, from a regular cold. Um, influenza uh, can, can be a good mimicker to coronavirus. Um, typically, when infectious disease uh, people think about influenza, we think about the abrupt onset of fever, myalgia, fatigue, and then the, uh, the progression of other symptoms. Um, and that might be one differentiating factor. There's no data for that, but that clinically at least um, may help us out. 
Okay, what about asymptomatic infection and spread? There's been a lot in the media, a lot in papers talking about asymptomatic individuals and infections and spread. Um, it's, this should not be news to many of us, right? Asymptomatic infection is well documented in many viral syndromes and infections, right? Influenza, one third to one half of all patients are asymptomatic. Measles, pertussis, Neisseria meningi and meningitis. All of these diseases are well known to the ID physician as being um, presenting um, asymptomatically. Majority of those in coronavirus that are uh, asymptomatic are children and young adults. Um, we do know, based on the experience from all of these other types of illnesses that can present in an asymptomatic way, that it is thought that the spread associated with these individuals who are less symptomatic uh, is, should be much, much less. Um, and there is early data showing that it, at least in coronavirus, uh, as, as well as in influenza, uh, more than half or, or more um, are less likely to, uh, to spread illness. Here is some convincing data. There's, again, a lot being made about this idea of the asymptomatic transmitter. And I want people to look very carefully at this epidemiology curve. This is one of the biggest studies that was done out of China. Um, it was done out of the Chinese version of the CDC over there. 72,000 patients here, um, and that includes surveillance level patients. Uh, and you can see here that the vast majority, blue is in, in uh, confirmed patients, uh, green suspected, uh, yellow clinically diagnosed, and uh, red, that little tiny bit over there, that's asymptomatic. Patients who are asymptomatic, but they uncovered coronavirus in them. Uh, and you can see that they make up a very small percentage of the overall. Uh, here's the initial epidemiology curve of what was coming at China when um, SARS really came on the scene. So that there were thousands, this is right here blue, this is the date of onset, and this is, in orange is the date of report. So before clinicians and many of us, many of our colleagues um, uh, in healthcare over there really understood what was happening on the ground with a new uh, novel virus, um, we had thousands of symptomatic patients that went undetected, unknowingly spreading disease and seen in healthcare without any personal protective equipment. That is really important to understand as we are healthcare, healthcare workers. We are um, coming into the scene where we understand a lot more and had a lot more time to prepare and um, be able to triage and screen patients in a way uh, so that we can protect ourselves. There was not that luxury in China, so very important to understand that. Um, here is a picture, I hope it's coming through okay, um, of, of what coronavirus spread in, in Chinese healthcare settings uh, may very well have been like, right? We had thousands of symptomatic patients again showing up and not being recognized for who they were. Here's a picture before, this is before um, coronavirus outbreak of a crowded waiting room. This has been a known thing um, in many countries around the world, including China, where um, this is what a waiting room may look like where you, before you even get triaged. Um, here on the right-hand side, this is an old picture. I was sure to pick an old one to make sure you knew that this is what things may look like before coronavirus. So this is hepatitis ward in, um, in, uh, in uh, China. So you can see the proximity of the beds, the congestion overall in, in places like that. Um, coronavirus mortality in China, you might say, uh, wow, the mortality is looking really poorly. Estimates have ranged from 1% to 4%. Um, mortality, of course, may very well, if you know, if you don't know that a wave is coming at you, you can't prepare properly, you have a, a huge subset of individuals that show up, and you might very well overwhelm the system. Here is a, um, a picture of a convention center that had been converted into uh, uh, planned um, uh, coronavirus housing. Uh, for, for symptomatic individuals. Okay, how infectious is coronavirus? Um, so this is, a, this is a graph that was published very early, uh, February 7th by the New York Times, but it's such a nice depiction that I decided to keep it on board. And at that time, we didn't know very much about COVID, um, and, but it was estimated that some coronavirus uh, would land somewhere in this pink box in terms of 
it's reproduction number. On the x-axis, you have the average number of people infected by each sick person. That's what a reproduction number is. On the y-axis is a fatality rate, and it's in a logarithmic scale. So just want to make sure you appreciate that. It's kind of a gray here. But what that means is uh, what we have learned now uh, in comparison reproduction um, number is 2.35 for COVID-19. Guess what the reproduction number for chicken pots is? It's way out here in that eight range. The uh, measles is one of the most infectious viruses known uh, on the planet. Um, and it is uh, it has a reproduction number of 15. Notably, after the travel restrictions went into place, um, a nice picture of paper published in Lancet IV that showed that the reproduction number dropped um, uh, to 1.05 after travel restrictions went into place. So with a lot of these um, uh, draconian measures that we are taking, um, and I didn't mean that in a bad way, but all these um, social distancing and other things that we are putting into place, I hope that gives some degree of comfort. <clears throat> So COVID-19 PCR detection on multiple body sites. Here's another thing that has been in the literature all over um, the place uh, uh, about what viral sheds, uh, what places the viral uh, shedding can be seen. Um, here's a case st study of nine patients. They did a bunch of um, uh, samples uh, with PCR and viral culture taken from multiple body sites um, between days one through 22 of hospitalization. And really the predominance was in the respiratory tract. It was detected throughout, highest in the pharyngeal samples and highest in the first week of illness. Um, so really important to understand because there have been reports in the media and elsewhere talking about fecal transmission, right? They flush the toilet, maybe you can get infected from something like that. Um, and the likelihood, all likelihood points um, far away from that. Blood, interesting. Early on, you may have noticed that the CDC had recommended blood samples be taken, oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal samples. Um, and they quickly backed off of that. Why? Because studies are showing that actually we're not detecting PCR in the blood. So fascinating. The disease really is sitting in the lungs, not even showing us enough viremia. Um, so very interesting to me. Um, Urine not detected at all, uh, and maybe one would expect that in a viral viral uh, uh, process that is RNA mounted. I'm not sure. Dr. Forth, all can comment. Um, stool high viral RNA counts. There are several papers sh showing high viral RNA. Um, but guess what? In this paper, they look for viable. The only study I found that looked for viable virus, and they could not find viable virus in the stool. So the clinical significance of a viral PCR really is unclear. Remember, just like our C. difficile, with a PCR test, you can detect it dead or alive. Here is another study uh, by Wang et al. published in JAMA very recently, I think. Um, and here you can see uh, they, they had about 20 patients, and they looked at a whole bunch of um, body sites. Uh, here in the circles of the BAL, for those who got the ALs done. Um, and then you can see for uh, this is the detection, the cycle threshold uh, between positive and negative is 40. So if you are above this line, you are positive. Below this line, uh, the, the sample is deemed negative. And you can see here a corroboration that you, you do have a lot of positivity in stool in other places, um, uh, even in a subclinical way, but, it, but it's not clear what that really means. And the other takeaway here is that you really should take away, look at all those little yellow uh, triangles. Those are all pharyngeal swabs. That's why we do nasopharyngeal swab. Okay, so what is the clinical significance of a positive PCR when you're trying to think in your mind about transmission, right? Assessing transmission risk. We get a lot of these questions in EIP. Um, and Susan's going to go over this in much more detail. So COVID-19 uh, PCR detects the presence of viral RNA, as we mentioned, and it really cannot tell us information about how viable that virus is. It can be positive for weeks after clinical infection results. We know this already in infectious disease and are humble to it every time we see a patient that we consult on um, C. difficile, influenza, RSV, dead or alive, we have to translate that information about positivity. So clinical cure, uh, testing for clinical cure, you've heard um, me say that a lot about C. difficile, doesn't, doesn't make sense, right? That's why it doesn't make sense. 
stool, again, no virus um, that was viable was found. Um, and then the other thing you have to remember about stool, uh, you know, I'm never surprised when I see stuff in stool uh, that might be respiratory because about 40% of your secretions in the nasopharynx are going to be swallowed, right? Are they coming out front or they're coming and they're going in the back? So it's not possible to translate detection of virus in body fluids um, to the ability for transmission. Um, so the risk factors for severe illness for COVID-19, uh, older adults age greater than 70, uh, uh, greater than or equal to 70, um, immunosuppressed uh, patients, and then chronic medical uh, conditions. I'm going to go into more detail on some of these, but a lot of these are things that you all could, uh, could uh, define as comorbid conditions right away. All right, so um, case fatality uh, highest amongst older patients. So here's some, you know, the, the numbers are really hard to get a handle on in this emerging uh, moment for COVID. Um, so surveillance data seems to be showing even in China a uh, case fatality rate. So case fatality, again, is the, how many people die amongst those um, that you really know have the disease. So China, 1.4% when you look at surveillance data, um, but if you look at their hospitalized data, it's 2.3%. That's what this data is, this is all amongst hospitalized um, individuals. In South Korea, they had a huge testing effort, right? They got the huge uh, denominator that they needed, and we see that the overall mortality really is 0.6% when you really look that hard for the virus. Um, so here's a table that shows by decile the, um, the number of deaths amongst confirmed cases. And you can see that under the age of 50, your case fatality rate really is 0.4 or lower. That should be somewhat comforting to many of us. Um, and then in the decile of 50 to 59, you see it will jump up 1.3% case fatality rate. But look at this, 60 uh, to 69, 3.6%, a real big bump up really is at 70 um, years old and higher, at 8% case fatality. Greater than 80 is 15% case fatality. Okay, the other um, you know, caveat to, as we're trying to understand uh, what, what really is, is the case fatality and what, how serious is um, COVID-19 for any given patient, um, is to put it all into perspective of the fact that we really do lack uh, reliable denominators, right? Uh, severely complicates our interpretation, but it does seem, that this is um, a table that I put together, together through the Johns Hopkins website, um, looking at different countries that I thought were interesting, look at worldwide case for some mortality, where it's sitting right now, take what you will of, of the denominator, 4.2%. Um, China uh, is around 4%. Look at Italy, we all have been following the news carefully about Italy, highest, very high mortality, 8.6% over there, probably um, something to do with not knowing their denominator very well, but perhaps the numerator is being uh, increased by the um, both the elderly population as well as um, uh, other things like comorbid conditions and smoking rates, which are uh, notably higher in Italy. Um, and then the other country that I would point out here is Germany. Uh, Germany has, has already seen about almost 20,000 cases, only 53 deaths and uh, with a mortality of 0.3%. So um, maybe implying that access to high level critical care uh, may be a factor in here. So what lab abnormalities are, are most common? Really, really interesting. And we see this in other diseases like EDD. Um, amongst hospitalized patients, most common lab abnormality, lymphocytopenia, that's not, that's not low white blood cells, but lymphocytes within the whole blood cell count are lower. But the range of 63 to 83% um, uh, uh, with a low lymphocyte count. White blood cell count can be high or low depending on when, when you catch the patient in their clinical illness. Um, elevated LFTs have also been found in up to 40% of patients. Thrombocytopenia seen in 36% of patients. Um, and strikingly, uh, serum procalcitonin is normal in most. Maybe that's because you don't detect it in blood. Who knows? Um, here you see uh, lab abnormalities associated with mortality. Um, some really interesting graphs. Um, this is separating out survivors and non-survivors 
Survivors are in blue over here. Um, and here's the lymphocyte count. This is the lymphocytopenia I was talking about. It really is striking, and it's striking from the get-go, from the day of, quote, admission, for, uh, day four of illness uh, onwards. There's quite a difference all the way through, and that difference only gets worse after the second week of illness. And look at over here, um, this is your LVH level. Again, this, a lot of this reminded me about uh, of EBV manifestations. Um, uh, uh, you have a nice uh, difference here, a higher LVH amongst those who are non-survivors and look at around two weeks or so they declare themselves on whether or not they're going to progress or not. Um, here's uh, uh, IL-6, um, which is one of our cytokines, a very inflammatory cytokine, um, and off the gate here amongst non-survivors, you have a high IL-6, and uh, amongst survivors, a little bit lower. These are all p-values I'm not sharing here, but they're all significant p-value differences. And off the gate, they are different. And then around, uh, just right here, day, uh, a week two, boom, people start to really declare themselves and as inflammation gets underway, full ARDS. Um, serum ferritin here, big difference between uh, those who survive and those who do not in progress into worsening illness. Orders of magnitude three to five times higher serum ferritin. This is not unpredictable, um, but it does make somebody think about like an EBV, hemophagocytic type of pathophysiology. Um, that's what that makes me think of. Um, okay, so here's the cardiovascular, I thought this was worth a call out, um, a cardiovascular disease associated <coughs> with um, COVID-19. Um, obviously, you can hear a lot in the news about hypertension and cardiovascular issues. Uh, we think, of course, that we have a prevalence of hypertension, diabetes, things like that are so high that you might just get confounding data. Um, but we also do know that viruses are well known to have cardiac impact, right? COVID-19 in, in particular, there's been, um, these are very small numbers. Uh, but it's not surprising to an infectious disease physician that you would see acute myocarditis possibly in the heart failure. Myocardial injury by advanced ischemia is the most easy thing that you might see in dysrhythmia, likely due to that hypoxia. But look at again, high sensitivity cardiac troponin here separates out. Look at our survivors all down in here in the blue. And here around, you know, they come in with this um, a little bit higher troponin, those, those ones who are going to go and progress. And then they really just shoot off around um, week two. Here are the radiographic findings of um, COVID. Uh, and it's the bilateral peripheral consolidations. I didn't have time, but you know, early on in your disease, you might very well see the characteristic thing that ID physicians look for for viral uh, pneumonias or walking noise interstitial pattern. Um, here is a more progressed patient bilateral peripheral consolidations, ground glass op opacities, and sometimes they can be out of proportion to, um, to their to symptoms. Uh, again, consolidations, ground glass. Okay, um, so testing, um, the ideal world versus reality. So in the ideal, we, we are all, we're hearing about the news and we're living the dream about testing um, and, and how we have to really be judicious. In the ideal world, we want to test everybody, whether mild or severe. Um, and we want to have real-time information to guide our clinical management moment to moment um, and to guide our infection prevention strategy. But the reality is, is that's not where we are. Testing capacity is, is still limited. Reagent availability, there's so many things that go into it, the chemicals that we need, the swabs that we need, um, staff and personnel to process the sample. Um, and then sensitivity data uh, for clinical disease uh, and when I say that, I mean the sensitivity to pick up what is actually happening clinically, not just in the laboratory, um, is unclear, maybe ranging from 40 to 75 percent. So then it becomes that CDF thing that we are always giving you CDPs about. Your, your clinical judgment is paramount. Okay, so then who should be prioritized for testing because we have to prioritize? The only, first and foremost, we, we must only test symptomatic patients. Our outpatient physicians are getting a lot of requests for testing asymptomatic individuals or even healthcare workers who are maybe exposed and they're just worried and they want to get tested for you know, either they have any they don't have any symptoms. Um, but that just doesn't make sense, certainly in a time and a moment where we have scarcity, but also because that will mess up your sensitivity, right? You're less likely to pick up a virus if you're not symptomatic, uh, and then you might need to get tested again, and that's just, a, um, that's not good, especially when you don't want to waste. 
Um, so patients whose symptoms or illness trajectory suggest a potential to be hospitalized, that's a person that uh, really should be prioritized for testing. Um, one thing to consider, and um, I'll go over the testing uh, timelines later, but we're, it's getting harder and harder to get a good turnaround time. Consider your chest x-ray as a first quick immediate way of understanding who's at high risk. Um, so symptomatic patients at high risk for severe disease, age, um, greater than 70, comorbid conditions, immunocompromised, those are all people that you want to specifically prioritize to um, get tested. Um, and then symptomatic individuals who have traveled internationally to an area of widespread COVID or contact with a confirmed case within 14 days. So epi history or high risk history, those are all things that um, would drive you to test. But you wouldn't want to just test everybody if you have a good idea of what they could be sick with, right? So fever, cough, they should have the right symptoms. Fever, cough, shortness of breath, um, and it can be present in many other uh, illnesses other than COVID. Um, so you really do have to look for the uh, it, alternatives, investigating alternative causes for respiratory illnesses. Um, that it really is key, not just for making or breaking the COVID diagnosis, but really for getting the patient the right care that they actually need for their whatever it is, congestive heart failure or COPD, because you want to give them steroids. Um, so do not test for COVID-19 if you have a cause of pneumonia that is well known to you, right? Aspiration, trauma, burns, so many things, post-obstructive pneumonias. Clinical pictures not consistent with viral process. That's another thing um, that you don't need to be tested for. Chronic symptoms are non-infectious lung findings, cough due to GERD, tumor, uh, many, many other reasons for a cough, including allergies, um, uh, hospital-acquired pneumonia, uh, and then, of course, a patient is asymptomatic, which I mentioned before. So what tests need to get sent? Uh, now, we, again, we started with this blood and then blood uh, oropharynx and nasopharynx. Now we're just down to nasopharyngeal samples that, that get sent to uh, for a PCR. Once you've made the decision that a patient actually rules in for testing, you're going to collect that with a sterile polyester tip swab uh, right here, depicted right here, and you put that in a single viral transport media vial. <coughs> and there are a couple places where you can get the testing done Orange County Healthcare. Um, agency has um, probably the, the one of the more clearer 24-hour turnaround times, but they are judiciously and rightfully so um, evaluating who needs testing and who doesn't need testing. Um, so you've got to meet their criteria. Um, and, uh, and of course, they have a different set of criteria that does also include a priority for healthcare workers um, to be tested because they understand full well that if a healthcare worker gets sick, that has that has a, a multiple impacts to the community. Um, and then the other uh, priority group for them is also the homeless individuals um, who could also spread uh, disease in the, in the community. Um, so LabCorp, also Equest, AREP, they all have tests up and running. But what we are seeing <coughs> is that the turnaround time is very, uh, very um, variable, uh, ranging from uh, a couple of days to, uh, uh, to a week is what I heard. Um, so UC Irvine Medical Center, we do have um, testing capability up and running through Cassie's um, lab, um, but that is, um, and they have a quick turnaround, but um, we can only do a limited number of tests at any given time. Uh, uh, hopefully that can be wrapped up at some point, but right now we still need to have some judicious thinking before we send away the test. Okay, so for outpatient testing, um, uh, or the ordering physician, you know, the, the same criteria basically apply that I've already talked about. Um, but for you in particular, in the outpatients, you really um, have a few things that we really do have to make sure uh, the process is straight on. Again, we don't test asymptomatic patients. Uh, that's the main place where we're getting a lot of requests for asymptomatic testing. Um, and then ask the patient to stay home until results return. That's a key thing. And when you see the patient, they might be terrified. They might have, um, uh, you know, special requests like hospitalization. Um, but if they have mild and moderate illness or mild illness, and they're not going to make admission criteria, they are really the kinds of uh, patients that can go home safe. We have materials available that talk to patients that allow them uh, to get coached through um, what they should do at home to make sure other people do not get sick. Um, go to the EIP SharePoint. 
Um, and then uh, the other thing for um, all of the outpatient folks is that you've got to be able to obtain the samples in a safe way. We have protocols in place. Uh, Nassim and her shop have done an outstanding job. And if you are still having questions on who, how to get testing done in the outpatient realm, um, please, please reach out to uh, her or Lauren Silva. Um, Follow-up results and, um, and discussions with the patient who really asking that the doctor who ordered the test really be the one who follows up and also discusses it with the patient. Um, and then if the test returns, the po uh, returns positive, uh, we ask that you report it to OSC Public Health. They are requesting that information. Um, finally, about treatments, what can be considered? Um, really, we all understand uh, for well, it's really largely supportive treatments. Um, but there are a lot of um, uh, lots of talk about investigational therapies that look somewhat promising. Uh, I think I might even turn it over to Dr. Forthall, who might be able to talk about some of these um, really well. Um, so remdesivir uh, is currently undergoing an NIH adaptive uh, randomized controlled trial, and it looks pretty um, promising based on only anecdotal data coming out of um, Asia. Uh, but nucleotide analog, it's a broad spectrum antiviral. It seems to be active and when patients receive it, it seems to be improving within about 48 hours or so. Chloroquine, um, lots in the news about chloroquine and uh, Dr. Porthall mentioned its capability as a uh, anti-inflammatory drug. It's an antiviral and it inhibits the cytokine storm to, to be a nice player here, uh, but still needs to be studied. Tocilizumab, um, IL-6 inhibitor, a special role here, because uh, as, as Dr. Forthall mentioned, the pathophysiology here, uh, it inhibits the cytokine storm, um, really could be a good um, drug for this group. Vagipiravir, um, the latest on the scene uh, that Dr. Forthall actually mentioned, is an RNA polymerase inhibitor, um, very, very early. I don't think there's any um, study that's actually been set up in, in humans in, in any good way yet. Um, but that's also on the horizon. And then I'm sure that many of you saw um, that Calitra, Lopinavir, Ritonavir, an old HIV drug, um, has, uh, has had some possible benefit uh, published anecdotally, uh, but a reminder why you have to be careful about um, what you may hear uh, without systematic study. In a New England Journal article uh, published two days ago, uh, the randomized control trial came out definitively that there was no benefit to using uh, Calitra in these patients. Um, and then there's uh, there's this idea of uh, ECMO to manage coronavirus associated ARDS. Um, I thought this was interesting to mention, you know, ECMO is something that uh, I have used in patients uh, or, you know, recommended or um, worked with patients on and seen wonderful um, impact from. Uh, and so it's hard to know, but we also understand that ECMO may stimulate IL-6. So in specific with, um, with coronavirus, I think the jury is actually out. Nobody is formally recommending the use of ECMO um, directly, but, uh, but it really is something that uh, no one knows the answer to. It could really help. But here I saw some pictures um, in a couple of studies, and this is the best one I found. Um, look at the uh, ARDS associated with this patient's illness. They were clearly going downhill. They got ECMO. Two days later, their CAT scan looks um, much better. Um, okay, so I, I wanted to put this slide in partly because I needed a summary slide, but um, the other part, because as I was listening, you know, looking into the literature and thinking about all the calls that we've gotten, uh, whether they be clinical or their um, uh, infection prevention <coughs> calls, and it really seems that, you know, we're, of course, in unprecedented times and our older physicians who have uh, practiced before we used to send a CAT scan on everybody or send a test on everybody really understand very well that clinical judgment is paramount, right? The triaging patients are where ER does every single day, what our um, a trauma patient, a trauma surgeons do all the time. You've got to use your clinical judgment on triaging who needs testing, who needs a diagnostic evaluation, and what kind of treatment, and be judicious with all of these things. The other thing is that all the literature that is coming out, you know, we, as our doctor hats on, are being tested to really look and appraise the literature carefully, appraise our patients' presentations very carefully, and really understand what it is that we're reading and not jump to judgment about um, translating whatever it is that you might be reading. Uh, and you've got to put the whole picture together. We tell this to our trainees every time. My, 
most important thing that I like to teach our medical students and our um, fellows is to put the whole picture together. And when you try to put the whole picture together for COVID, it really seems that it boils down to all of these things that you've got to do these things to be able to understand and help our patients the best that we possibly can. So, Shruti, before you come down, if you can go back to your asymptomatic slide, I think there's some um, a lot of people who were um, who misinterpreted your comment about oh. the large amount of asymptomatic um, cases in influenza, and I think they're responding um, on the chat about um, the very large number of asymptomatic cases in COVID-19. So I ah. think you may need to clarify your comments okay. about so which virus you're referring to oh, and how okay. much asymptomatic. Right. Okay, sorry for that confusion. So influenza and many other infections can be seen as an asymptomatic disease. You can uncover these organisms in patients who don't have any symptoms a third to a half of the time. So what I meant to say by that is that many people are, have asymptomatic disease and that we shouldn't be thinking that coronavirus is any um, is, is different. Uh, and here is the uh, Meaning it's not a surprise, but when you look at the, uh, uh, the symptomatic versus asymptomatic cases, they are tiny, tiny, tiny. Look at the asymptomatic is in red. So hopefully people can see that. It's a, it's a very small fraction of the number of people who um, really uh, are, are COVID positive. It's mostly symptomatic individuals. And the other thing is, is that what you're finding in the literature sometimes is that people talk about symptomatic um, asymptomatic patients, and then when you really talk to the patient or you find out later that they actually are symptomatic or they develop symptoms later. So, um, so you shouldn't uh, take away from this that uh, the majority are asymptomatic. What we may mean to say here is, is that, um, can you present asymptomatically? Sure like other viruses. That's what I meant by that comment. And that all the rest of the vast majority really are symptomatic. Does that help? 